She dotes on that spoiled son of hers. Why, she probably believes him to be the second coming of Christ, though he flirts with every single woman in the village, old or young. You see, Nelly, I am nothing like Aubrey. I would rather die than become a rover like him. Me feelings for you, my dear Cornelia, are molded from a different cast. <laughs> you have captured me art with your infernal beauty, and now mine eyes can wander no further. You are me sweet red rose, newly sprung in June. Oh, well, Cornelia flustered, though she flustered though she was by Emmeline's teasing, had enough wits about her to recognize that line. Are you quoting poetry at me now, Emmy? Indeed. Did you know that me love is like melody, sweetly played in tune? D don't be an idiot. If you wish to serenade me, you could at least write a poem of your own. But I know you appreciate it, really. In all honesty, I think you're being rather foolish. I cannot help myself, though. I really do love you, Cornelia. I love you so. Sometimes I fear I may go mad. What do you know of madness? I know when you are not by my side, I miss you horribly. And I find myself counting down the minutes, no, the very seconds, until we may be in one another's company once more. Uh, well, um, I appreciate your feelings, Emmy. I, um, I, I kind of like penis, though. I, I love you, too. Achievement unlocked. Like a singing bird. If only Emmeline and Cornelia had continued to spend the summer together in a sweet manner, smiling and laughing, or else bickering pointlessly and making one another pale, yet always parting words of love and kisses stolen beneath the warm summer sun. Unfortunately, such moments could not last forever. The splendors of the summer soon faded, and the leaves began to turn brown, and the wind gained a sharp edge that made Emmeline shiver. It was also during the autumn months that Philip Burns had returned home for the first time in half a year. This reunion, however, was not quite as happy as the previous one had been. Philip Burns had always been a small man, yet he seemed even smaller during that bitter and bitingly cold September. He stooped more than usual when he encountered the, entered the rooms, if he entered them at all, for he had developed a bit of an habit of lingering ghost-like about the thresholds of his own home as a long, though afraid of stepping inside. It was almost as though during the six months surge into London, he had lost something crucial of his constitution, his sense of himself, or else his soul. Philip's fate was still planted firmly upon the earth, but he was divorced from the world around him. He drifted aimlessly, like some bullist, yet he was restless within his dream world, incapable of sitting still for more than five minutes at a time. It looked like things without seeing at them, ate food without testing it, ate objects without looking at them. Once he tried to pick up his glass during dinner, and used so little force that it slipped between his fingers, smashing into the pieces on the floor. Even when he smoked to Emmeline, it was without any real feeling, like he was reciting words from a play script, and Philip Burns had never been a very good actor. It was not like Cornelia's father who had so much hoof and puff he could have blown down even the brick home that was built by the most industrious of the three little pigs. Philip Burns was by far too honest, and that was the worst thing. It was because he was an honest man that Emily knew, though he tried to keep the truth from her. Something was wrong. Something was terribly wrong. 